So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as part of the Global Early Adolescence Study. My name is Kristen Mari, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And I'm one of the co-principal investigators of the Global Early Adolescence Study. So I'm excited to bring to you this exciting webinar. Um, you will hear from several speakers from different parts of the globe representing key members of our research team, program implementing partners, and even a member of our Global Early Adolescent Advisory Board. So these speakers will include uh, Jen Gales from Save the Children. We have Ray from Rutgers, Indonesia, IFTA from Gaja Madan University, Kara Hunterson from Johns Hopkins, and Tisu, who, who is our Global um, Youth Advisory Board member from the Environmental Concerned Youth Association. And that will be followed by Rebecca Lundgren from University of California at San Diego, and she will be leading our Q&A. So just a few housekeeping items um, for this webinar. For efficiency, we're gonna ask you that if you have any questions to just write them in the Q&A, and then at the end, when we have the um, discussion, we will answer your questions in the order they we received. We do have some members of our team who are um, in this webinar, and they may be also able to address some of them as we go along, but we do have some time at the end to hopefully go through most of your questions. So this webinar is a presentation of the results among different gender transformative interventions that were evaluated as part of our study and are now incorporated into a special supplement for the Journal of Adolescent Health. Um, and this was launched in June 15th as an early launch, but the official launch is gonna be July 15th. So I will wait, Trevor, for you to share your slides and then we can begin. Okay, next. So before we go through some of these results that are related to the supplement, I just wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about who we are as the Global Early Adolescent Study. So this study is really a global network of research and program partners. And we have the overarching goal to build knowledge, advocate and intervene to promote gender equality and positive health over the life course. So within that goal, we have two primary aims. And the first one is, is a longitudinal, um, which is about to understand how gender as a social system informs health and well-being across the adolescent years and how this process really unfolds in different sociocultural contexts. The second aim, which is bolded um, and the focus for this webinar is really then to test how gender transformative interventions in early adolescence contribute to improving adolescent health and well-being. So next slide. So some of you may be wondering, well, why should we bother to focus on gender equality in very young adolescents, which we define as those between the ages of 10 and 14? Well, first of all, gender equality is actually a core global goal. We have SDG 5, the Sustainable and Development Goal, which is aimed at achieving gender equality by the year 2030. So if we want to do that, we really need to focus on populations across the life course. And one of those is early adolescence, which is a really critical window for gender norm formation. It's when adolescents really start reflecting and analyzing the norm messages that they're receiving. And it, it, it represents a key time where interventions can really address gender. Another reason is that gender-based violence, we know from abundance um, of evidence, increases in this age group. And we see this among both boys and girls. But despite all this, we have limited understanding on how adolescents actually perceive all of these rules, how they change across time, and the impact that interventions can have on even shifting and influencing their gender attitudes and beliefs. So this then segues to our supplement. And here it is right here. And, and the, the assumption behind this, this supplement was, while we know there's been a lot already published on the impact of gender stereotypes and norms of health over the life course, especially among adults, we knew really far less among younger adolescents. And so we wanted to use this as an opportunity to know how best to intervene at this time and whether intervening allows us then to see shifts in equitable gender norms for improving sexual and reproductive health outcomes. So the key questions behind this that we'd like you all to kind of use as a basis for these presentations is, well, first of all, we were interested in, in understanding what outcomes were more likely to be impacted by gender transformative interventions. 
And did this vary by site, population, and program? What implementation factors mattered most and how did these vary by site? And then what are the key learnings and best practices that have relevance for other gender transformative interventions, again, outside of this um, study? So with that, I am going to hand it off to Jen, who's going to share with you um, the intervention results on Growing Up Great. So Jen, over to you. Thank you, Kristen. I'm so pleased to be here today to present Growing Up Great on behalf of our team. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of my many colleagues at Save the Children DRC and our eight local partner organizations who oversaw implementation of the intervention, as well as the Center for Gender Equity and Health at UCSD who supported overall learning and scale up efforts as the prime for the project. Next slide. I'll start with a quick overview of Growing Up Great. Um, it is a multi-level gender transformative sexual and reproductive health program for in-school and out-of-school very young adolescents and their influencers in Kinshasa DRC. And it draws on learning from evidence-based approaches implemented in other countries, which were adapted for the urban Kinshasa context. Growing Up Great intervenes at multiple levels of the socio-ecological model to increase VYA's self-efficacy, gender equitable attitudes and behaviors, and reproductive health knowledge, encourage positive interactions between VYAs and adults at home and in school and healthcare environments, and shift restrictive social norms on gender and adolescent sexuality. So it's aiming to, to shift a lot. <laughs> and as part of the intervention, VYAs participate in weekly learning and discussion sessions in school or community-based clubs. They use a modular flexible toolkit that can be explored in any order rather than a set curriculum. Teachers are trained to support school clubs and to integrate the toolkit into classroom-based lessons of the National Family Life Education Program. Parents and community members are engaged in small group sessions to reflect on and discuss norms and behaviors supportive of adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And finally, health providers are trained in adolescent friendly health services and host visits for VYA clubs at nearby health facilities. Growing Up Great was specifically designed for scale following ExpandNet guidance. And so all elements of the intervention were developed to align with government priorities and link to existing policy documents and programs. Here you see on the slide a snapshot of the project cycle, which was designed to maximize opportunities for research and learning, adaptation, and eventually scale up. Today, my presentation focuses on the pilot intervention and evaluation, which is the section inside the blue box here. So after a brief test of intervention materials, which we called our learning lab, phase two here, and a launch of the baseline survey in June, 2017, Growing Up Great was implemented from 2017 through 2018 in two low-income communes of Kinshasa. Following the intervention, an end-line survey took place in late 2018. We'll take a closer look at the evaluation findings over the next few slides and then come back to this timeline at the end to touch on the scale-up sections. The evaluation of Growing Up Great was conducted by the Global Early Adolescent Study through collaboration with the Kinshasa School of Public Health. The evaluation had a longitudinal quasi-experimental design with an intervention and a control arm, each divided into two subgroups, in-school and out-of-school adolescents. In total, there were five waves of data collection with wave one serving as the baseline and wave two serving as the end line. Three subsequent waves of data collection provided information about how effects persisted or faded among the study cohort over time, but we'll focus on wave one through two findings in today's presentation. Our team conducted difference and difference analysis to assess differences between the intervention and control groups while accounting for baseline differences. Additionally, several qualitative studies complemented GEAS findings. A rapid qualitative study sought to assess the feasibility and scalability of school and health linkages components of growing up great. A responsive feedback approach captured and processed multiple sources of implementation data through quarterly learning meetings in collaboration with the technical advisory group of key stakeholders. And finally, the project's Youth Advisory Council, with support from local researchers, conducted a youth-led qualitative evaluation of Growing Up Great. The GEAS evaluation examined Growing Up Great's impact on four intermediate outcomes aligned with the project theory of change, SRH knowledge, 
which included pregnancy and HIV knowledge scales, as well as knowledge of where to seek SRH services. Agency and assets, such as body image and relationships with caregivers, gender equitable attitudes and norms, and gender equitable and nonviolent behaviors. Growing up great led to positive outcomes in each of these categories. It improved SRH knowledge in different ways among in-school and out-of-school cohorts relative to the control groups. Among in-school adolescents, it increased pregnancy and HIV knowledge. Among out-of-school adolescents, it increased knowledge of where to get condoms and contraception. And across both groups, it increased knowledge of where to get information about menstruation. And this effect was strongest among younger VYAs, those under 12 years. It also increased important assets, including positive relationships with caregivers and communication with trusted adults. It had a strong effect on caregiver connectedness among both in-school and out-of-school adolescents. It increased communication about sexual relationships and contraception among out-of-school adolescents, especially among girls and younger VYAs. And it increased body satisfaction among out-of-school girls, though it did not have an effect on body comfort. Growing up great had more mixed effects on gender attitudes and norms. It increased gender equitable attitudes towards chore sharing. That is the idea that boys and girls should both do chores, but it had no effect on other gender norm perceptions, which the GEAS uses across sites as sentinel measures of gender equality. Finally, growing up great had some limited effects on gender equitable and nonviolent behaviors. It increased equal sharing of chores between boys and girls, as reported by boys, and decreased teasing and bullying, but only among out of school adolescents. Qualitative findings from implementation research and the youth led evaluation provided important complementary information to help understand these impact evaluation results. The rapid study revealed a challenging school environment, which created obstacles for school based implementation of the intervention. It also indicated that trainings for VYA club facilitators and teachers, which were condensed with the aim of increasing the intervention scalability, were not comprehensive enough to build mastery of participatory dialogue-based facilitation techniques. However, the youth-led evaluation nevertheless revealed many positive changes among adolescents and their caregivers, most notably improved knowledge and practice of gender equality in the household, and improved parent-child communication on sensitive issues. Coming back to our timeline, the findings of our mixed methods research were a critical source of information for later phases of the project. Evaluation findings factored heavily into our scalability assessment and qualitative findings allowed us to adjust the intervention for improved, improved effectiveness at scale. Ultimately, we scaled up Growing Up Great from 2020 through 2023 in partnership with the DRC government, expanding into a new commune of Kinshasa and institutionalizing the program within the government. Next slide. We worked with three ministries to institutionalize different components of Growing Up Great. School-based components were taken up by the Ministry of Education's Family Life Education Department with program materials integrated into in-service training, the teacher manual and curriculum, and inspired by this approach, the Ministry of Social Affairs piloted a similar approach in remedial education centers that aim to reintegrate out of school children back into the formal education system. Family and community activities were integrated into the scope of community health workers and health activities with facility-based providers were integrated into the National Adolescent Health Program's three-year strategic plan. Growing up great ended earlier this year, so implementation has now fully transitioned to government and NGO actors who accompanied us throughout the project. So this is a very high level overview of Growing Up Great's seven years of project work, and it really is just the tip of the iceberg. We have produced a wealth of resources on Growing Up Great's design, implementation, evaluation, and scale, and all of those are available on our website, growingupgreat.org. So we welcome you to explore more on your own time. Thank you very much. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Ray. Thank you very much, um, Jen. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar. 
Uh, my name is Ray. I'm the program manager for the Power to Youth, and I'm here to present uh, today with my colleague from Gajah Mada University, um, Ifta, um, on uh, our program Satara, a comprehensive sexuality education intervention for very young adolescents in Indonesia. Um, so uh, for next slide, Satara means equal in Bahasa Indonesia, stands for Semangat Dunia Remaja or the Spirit of Adolescent World. It is a two-year CSE module designed for students in grade 7 and 8 of junior high school, aged between 12 uh, and 15 years old. Um, developed in collaboration with uh, numerous stakeholders and also led by Rutgers Indonesia in 2017, Satara follows the UNESCO uh, International Technical Guidance on Sexual Education. Um, the program, the module itself, seeks to help adolescents to feel more comf comfortable with puberty, increase their uh, self-confidence, and ultimately contribute to reducing sexual and gender-based violence, um, preventing unwanted pregnancies, and also early marriages. Notably, Satara incorporates um, a reflection on gender and power dynamics. The Satara module itself also encourages adolescents to be more aware of where to seek help if they become victims of harassment, force or early marriages or any other harmful practices. It also raises awareness of these issues within their surroundings, including their peers and family. Specific chapters in Satara are dedicated to discussing the referral systems in schools and communities and the services they can access that are adolescent and youth friendly. Uh, currently, Satara is implemented in six districts, reaching uh, 4,183 students. It is aligned with the commitment of the government of Indonesia to train 3,060 uh, CSE teachers by 2024 as a part of the MOU between Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health and Culture. Um, we have implemented Satara through several programs, namely GUSO, Yes, I Do, and currently Power to Youth and Right Here, Right Now, too. Uh, for the next couple of slides, my colleague Ifta will present uh, the key results of the Satara evaluation through some conducted studies. Um, Ifta, I think uh, time is yours. Thank you, Rhea. So we were able to develop and conduct a global early study in Indonesia in connection with Satara implementation. So we were able to also evaluate Satara. So these actually have two components. So we have the quantitative study to using global early adolescent study and qualitative implementation research that are done by other college in uh, Universitas Indonesia. So the global early adolescent study was conducted in those three like pilot Satara program, which has different characteristic and socio-political and cultural context, uh, which is Bandar Lampung is more conservative, uh, majority Islamic society, and Semarang is more moderate uh, and probably more modern Islamic society. And Bali is, of course, we all know this is a very open international global village on uh, uh, tourism. So we were able to get uh, somewhat like representative, but also very uh, background of Indonesian young people. So we include 18 schools. Nine of them are intervention Satara school and nine are control groups in those three locations, which covering about 4,500 students in seven and eight grades. So the mean age of the student upon entering Satara program is 12 years old. And the implementation research, the qualitative part is a huge part also of this Satara evaluation because it gives like a, a precious insight upon the mechanism and theory of change mechanism of the Satara program. Uh, we were we were able to identify the mechanism through Satara mostly have influence and also the quality and the quantity of Satara implementation itself in each school. So you can see here the timeline of uh, global early adolescent study at wave one at the baseline before the Satara implementation. And then we've 
and then root girls implemented Satara for two years. After that, we were able to do wave two and wave three global early adolescent study to evaluate the short term and long term effect of Satara. But you can also see that the Satara implementation is very diverse in each of these cities and in every grade also. And unfortunately, due to COVID closure and disease control in the middle of uh, 2020, Satara was either implemented online or was not implemented completely in the school, in some of the school. Next slide. So these are like the uh, maybe like simplified findings of Satara impact on several aspects of adolescents' sexual and reproductive health and well-being. So we have several outcomes that we identify, including uh, knowledge, attitude, and skill around sexual and reproductive health. And a big part of it is also about gender transformation. So basically, Satara has positive impacts on a lot of this uh, outcome, including knowledge about pregnancy, which increased for all girls and boys, and also several of the indices about gender stereotypical uh, attitudes and knowledge. Uh, but most of them are actually only significant for girls. Although like if it's uh, evaluated uh, uh, consecutively for both boys and girls, they actually uh, lower support in the lower support for gender stereotypical attitudes. Uh, from the qualitative implementation research, we also found uh, explanation that uh, actually support this quantitative finding. So Setara is mainly very effective in influencing student attitudes and knowledge about poverty by providing more knowledge and removing taboo and providing normalization by talk openly and discuss openly for between teacher and students and also debunking myths. So that's why like a lot of the impact of Satara reported by students during the qualitative implementation research is about, uh, about feeling more normal and less afraid or more confidence about the puberty development during their adolescence. But it's less, less beneficial or less impactful in the fields of norms and values, and students actually reported a uh, limited uh, reflection or reporting about discussion about norms and values. And they actually also talk about the strong, the still strong norms and value regarding gender and sexuality. That's why probably we see less impact of Satara on those norms and values and uh, sensitive topics around sexuality and reproductive health. Next. <clears throat> this is also uh, other areas of improvement that, uh, that can be seen from the study. So there is a positive effect about normality to be curious about sex and love among boys and girls, and also uh, improve attitude and maybe experience about uh, violence and bullying, uh, but it's mostly uh, observed among girls more than boys. And tobacco use is so much higher among boys, so the effect is positive uh, and very significant among boys. But we can see there is uh, maybe not yet if, uh, significant effect of Satara on several outcome related to sexuality and dating, because this is like a very strong value that maybe Satara is not yet uh, strong enough uh, discussing about these norms and values. Next. <clears throat> 
So upon reflection of those quantitative study and qualitative study results, uh, we can maybe uh, conclude that despite COVID hampering the, the delivery and the completeness of Satara, uh, we see positive effect of Satara on specific aspects, certain aspects, not all aspects of uh, young people health and development um, primarily around puberty uh, and knowledge uh, uh, improvement but not on the topics that are value or norms laden and may be sensitive and highly needing uh, maybe class management skills from the teacher so this finding indicates that right-based comprehensive sexuality education can uh, improve the knowledge and attitudes of young people, especially if it's given earlier in the, their adolescent stage development. But we can see from the implementation study that we have uh, various uh, results uh, in the various contexts of the study site because there is a strong impact of socio-cultural context, whereas a lot of disagreement or maybe uh, dub or even straightforward con contra uh, for the implementation of Satara. Also, there are a lot of variety about the completeness and fidelity of the Satara implementation due to lack of time, lack of uh, class management and teachers training and teacher fellow and uh, whether they actually deliver all the Satara materials with, with all the class exercise that intends to provide more transformative experience for students. So we can see those who have higher dose of Satara implementation have a biggest uh, positive influence in the quantitative study. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Ifta, um, for the key uh, findings and the results of the evaluation of the Satara. I'm going to close this um, um, presentation really quick. There are three main points that we're going to do next. The first one, uh, one of the recommendation of the um, um, GS is is that we're going to um, um, there's the need to uh, intervene the parents itself so that we're going to actually work with the BKKBN, the National Family Planning Agency, to reach out to parents and to teach them about SRHR because after going back home, uh, adolescents have no confidence to talk or to even share any or ask about any information related to their uh, sexual reproductive health and rights. The second one will be linking with the government program. One of them is the Child Marriage Prevention Program program um, that uh, we're going to also uh, involve the um, out-of-school uh, um, children or out-of-school adolescents in the uh, village children forum so that it will be holistic and it will be um, a whole school, uh, whole approach that um, um, the intervention we're going to do. The last but not least, we also are going to scale up by uh, digitalizing the Satara itself. We already digitalized it and um, it's already available in uh, our website as well. So uh, any school that would like to have uh, CSE in their um, a curriculum can also access the um, digitalized version of Satara. So all in all, we hope that by having this uh, idea of incorporating the um, Satara in, in government program and also uh, link it with um, a prestigious um, program that the government has already have, like the BKKBN's uh, BKR, uh, the, the, the Adolescent Family uh, Development. We hope that it can uh, increase the buy-in of the government to scale it up further uh, as one of the um, good achievement we had already is that the government uh, would like to uh, train the CSC teacher in until 2024. And we hope that the um, effect can be um, really, uh, we can really see the impact um, of the um, CSC to uh, very young adolescents itself. 
Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, pass it on to um, Kara. Thank you so much, Ray. So I am going to uh, do a little bit of summary and uh, represent the papers in the supplement that take a cross-site look at you know, how these interventions were um, implemented, some of the challenges, some of the successes, and try to get a better understanding of how they compared and thus what um, attributes of the interventions and attributes of the implementation um, affected the impact and, and to see if we can draw out any concepts from each one to see what are the common things that led to success. So some of the things that we see um, as comparison between the two interventions, um, we see that Sitara seem to have a, a greater effect at improving gender normative perceptions, that's to say, um, creating more gender equal perceptions and improving SRH, uh, sexual and reproductive health communication. Um, whereas for growing up great, we saw greater effects on sexual and reproductive health knowledge. And we did also see strong effects on specific aspects of gender equality and, and specifically in household chores, as, as Jen was sharing earlier. But we also see um, within intervention differences based on um, factors like implementation and the population being addressed. So as Ray was just, as Ray and Ifta were just describing for Sitara, um, there were some differences in implementation. So, so for example, we saw that there were the strongest effects of the intervention in Semarang over Denpasar and Bandar Lumpung. And, and that is largely because Semarang was the only site that was able to implement all of the Sitara curriculum. Um, due to COVID restrictions, a lot of the curriculum or, or some of the curriculum in Denpasar and Bandar Lampung could not be implemented. And thus, um, some of the effect that, that could have affected some of the impact. Um, also, there were certain cultural taboos, as Ifta was describing, that caused facilitators to maybe feel uncomfortable implementing some of the curricula. And um, that, that affected the, the fidelity of, of the intervention. So from that, we can have an understanding of needing to do much more work with facilitators to make sure that they are comfortable with the material and that they are um, well-trained to, to discuss such sensitive topics as sexual reproductive health and gender norms. In Growing Up Great, we saw within the intervention, there were greater effects among out-of-school adolescents, as well as among girls. So what we've heard uh, through the qualitative work that was done as part of their evaluation is that um, facilitators were gearing those sexual and reproductive health lessons more towards girls because it was seen culturally as more pertinent to them. So boys who were sitting there that were receiving this curriculum didn't feel that it was particularly, um, that, that it was as relevant to them and thus um, absorb that information differently. There were also limitations from the government on what content could be delivered. So the curriculum had to be adjusted according to those requirements. So it's a similar phenomenon as what happened in Sitara, where there is some discomfort with this material and that really formative work of uh, making sure that it is culturally acceptable and doing that work to speak with parents and facilitators and teachers to make sure that 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 curriculum can be implemented. So you'll see some of those differences in impact in the next couple of slides. So next slide, we have the results from um, the gender norm paper that looks at those, those gender normative results across sites. And as you can see um, in Sitara, we have a lot of so so in the in the blue you see a positive effect of the intervention that means that gender norms were decreasing or gender equality was increasing and as i mentioned before we see the greatest effects in semarang for sitara and we also see um some some greater effects for girls whereas boys um in some cases became more gender unequal 
So again, we see these differences by group and differences by site um, being really apparent. And then in the next slide, we see these results for the sexual and reproductive health outcomes. And as I mentioned before, um, in growing up great, we see that girls are really feeling that, that impact more than boys. They are having greater improvements than boys and, and out of school girls as well, having, having more progress. And there are some, as Jen mentioned, uh, potential reasons for this, that in growing up great, um, the out of school participants were working with trained facilitators, whereas the in school participants um, were working with teachers that were trained in the growing up great material. And then again, for Satara, we see that um, a lot of the effects, most of the effects for sexual and reproductive health are occurring in Semarang. But inter interestingly, we also see um, a lot of positive effect for boys. So in this case, you know, there are there are definitely multiple possible reasons for this, one of them being that um, boys potentially had further to come in their knowledge um, since since girls are exposed to some sexual and reproductive health information maybe earlier because again it is seen as more relevant to them but also you know that when material is is geared towards both girls and boys that boys can see a positive impact and do see a positive impact so we'll get a little bit more into the reasoning behind why these, these changes might be the case uh, when Kristen goes through the theory of change. Great, thank you very much. So um, one of the things that we, we did at the very beginning when we were starting to evaluate these programs was we formed an intervention um, working group, which we creatively called. Um, and this was really made up of researchers and program implementers across different gender transformative interventions. So not only Satara and Growing Up Great, which you just heard, but we also have members um, in our group of from CRAFT, which was a trauma-informed gender transformative intervention implemented in New Orleans, Nisitu, which was a gender transformative intervention implemented in Nairobi, but had more of a financial literacy entry point, and then Very Young Adolescents 2.0, um, implemented or was about to be implemented if, if COVID did not occur in Blantyre, um, Malawi. And so with each of our gender transformative interventions, we thought, why don't we get together and see if it's possible to create a theory of change? So here is what we came up with. I know you cannot see it very well, so I'm going to just break it down um, into pieces, but you can see the, the different colors here. So at this top part of the model, this is the first part, um, you can see their interventions represented by the colors. And anytime you see a rainbow of colors, that just connotes that um, all of the interventions are um, associated with the particular outcome. So here in this slide are the long-term and short-term outcomes. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see that the majority of the programs were targeting sexual and reproductive health and violence, fewer on mental health and education. Among the short-term outcomes, we break that down into behavioral, interpersonal, and individual knowledge, attitudes, and self-efficacy. And again, you can see um, where the colors are, um, um, are associated with each outcome. And that, again, denotes which intervention is trying to change these outcomes. So comfort with engaging sexuality, critical consciousness, um, improved conflict resolution. Those are some of the more um, common types of outcomes that were being targeted. So next slide. So then we go to the middle part of the model, and this is where we really focus on the interventions. So with this, you can see there are three columns that I want to point out. The first one is the delivery column or the facilitation column. Then there's the content in the curriculum in the middle. And then the last yellow column is the supportive environment, or these are the partnerships and key stakeholders um, needed to implement the intervention. And then at the bottom, the bottom row is the activities, what was actually done, and then that is followed by this um, mechanisms of change within each of these components. So again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to point out activities with um, some of the facilitation included supportive supervision, values clarification, training, um, content and curriculum. Many of them had small group discussions, educational sessions, and then in the supportive environment included parent engagement, systems integration, and community sensitization. And that then led to the mechanisms and change. 
Now for the last part, this, this end, um, the bottom of the theory of change, this is really what we consider the foundation. And here you um, we've highlighted and I've circled the conditions for success. And in the supplement, we spend a lot of time talking about each of these. Essentially what these are, are these are the factors that we all found in common with our implementation research that really did influence um, the success of the implementation of the intervention. And so again, I'm not gonna go through all of them, they're in the paper, but you can see just to give you one example, um, we did see with facilitation that um, they really needed to be comfortable with the material to be able to successfully deliver it comfortably. So that was a key thing. Um, share, and also having shared values of the curriculum, which Kara already pointed out and many others um, did not resonate with some of the facilitators, especially the teachers in some of the spaces. Um, so I wanna go to the next slide just because of the time. Um, and just to kind of, I, we've already talked about some of these, but to point out some that weren't emphasized as much, um, one of the key things too um, about implementation and, and was a key factor um, in both Satera and in Growing Up Great was the government approval and, and understanding how best to get the support to deliver these types of intervention was really important. And in some cases, um, even though the government allowed the intervention to be implemented through the negotiation process, there were certain content that just could not be taught. Um, and so knowing that ahead of time is, is a really important consideration as we go forward. Um, the other thing that I just wanna highlight too is that we often talk about dose and, and duration, which are very important. But the other thing that to consider is that in some cases, even if we had the right duration or the, um, the curriculum allotted for that, it was really hard to structure that within the school day. So that's another important factor that needs to be considered is if it's especially gonna be delivered as part of the school curriculum or within the school curriculum, knowing when and how much time could be allotted is an important um, thing to, to think about um, before. So I wanna move on and really end with our key messages. Um, and this is pulling from all across um, our intervention findings from both the impact and the implementation research. So the first is really this notion about that Intervention effects on normative gender perceptions really differed by program, and we could see that with especially the growing up great in Cetera. Um, and when we were reflecting on this, there was actually a review, a recent review by Stewart et al. that showed that actually when we think about what is the particular gender message that is being targeted, that needs to be really reflected, especially among the adolescents. So do they feel, do, can they identify with the message? Do they Are they engaged with the messaging? That may have some impact on whether we're gonna see effects in those particular attitudes being changed. The other thing that we've um, shown is that girls seem to be benefiting most. And some of this may be related to um, how boys and girls learn and also how they respond to the gender norms. So we know that boys and girls are affected differently by these messages. So depending on what the particular message is and what the norm is that's being targeted, that may have a differential effect on boys and girls. So we need to understand um, this better, um, especially about how, how do boys respond versus girls and, and how we may wanna tailor the interventions around that. We also found that studies, um, a, a, the same review by Stewart found that girls may also be responding differently to the different approaches. So they found that in general, girls may be responding better to educational-based interventions, whereas boys may respond better to community mobilization um, types of efforts. Similarly, we, we already showed the challenges that the interventions faced in implementation. And I think this really demonstrates that as a field, we not only need to consider whether an intervention works, but how well it is, is working in the field and to really provide more emphasis on sharing best practices and, and lessons learned um, with implementation. And then finally, the last thing that I wanna just say is that um, these interventions still primarily focused on adolescents. Um, the change that was measured was primarily on adolescents, not on other key socialization agents, such as parents, teachers, and in some cases, religious leaders, who are also providing these norms messages to adolescents. And so if we don't also integrate them into our interventions, it's highly unlikely that um, we're going to see sustained change over time, especially uh, on these gender equality norms that we're trying to um, work on. So I think with that, 
Um, I am going to now um, have the delight to um, have one of our um, Global Youth Advisory Board members, Tisu, provide a little snapshot of the commentary that she and another um, youth member did for our supplement. So Tisu, if you're with us and if you can join us, why don't you go ahead? Hi, my name is Tisungani Stima, a member of Youth Advisory Board. I am here to share with you youth commentary on adolescent interventions, which was published by Journal of Adolescent Health. I wrote this uh, journal with my fair friend from Indonesia, Kevin Putra, uh, yeah. but he's not here. So I'll share with you what's in the journal. The aim of the journal was to give tips to organizations and institutions on how best they can implement adolescent programs for effective results. Uh, we have heard earlier the presentations that, that, that have been made uh, about the uh, study that they have been conducting, the results of it. But here are the tips that uh, organizations and institutions can employ. One, the they should create safe spaces for adolescents to um, share their experiences and these groups should be led by their fellow adolescent or someone who is open enough to understand the feelings of the adolescents and the organizations should also be inclusive they should include the adolescents right from the planning stage to the evaluation stage and they should not exclude adults. These adults are social socialization agents, which um, which have a vital role in the development of of the adolescents. This can be parents, teachers, or church leaders, because um, involving them, they can make it they make them understand and know the experiences and aspirations of the adolescents. Last three, um, the full purpose of the uh, the journal was to uh, in, encourage the organizations to engage the youth and the adolescents in all the stages and processes of the um, programs, because the adolescents are resources to be harnessed and not problems to be solved. Thank you so much. Why don't we um, jump to the Q&A because um, we don't have much time left. And so I'm going to um, have Rebecca um, step in. Rebecca, welcome. Thanks, Kristen. And thanks, Tisu. We we'll look forward to hearing your recorded remarks. So there's been some really great um, questions in the chat already. So let me start with a couple. And then if we have time, um, just either yeah, raise your hand or we'll just you can go off mic. So the first question I wanted to ask was very early today. There was a question about for growing up great, what was accounted for the lack of progress in some metrics and why, or is it true that there, were, there was more effect on out of school adolescents? And I think you heard a little bit more about this from Kara's remarks. So I'm gonna ask Kat, Kate Barker from UCSD to respond to that. Over to you, Kate. Thanks Rebecca and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I think that's a really loaded question. There are a lot of different aspects um, to the program um, that we saw some change on and some um, indicators that we did not see change on. Um, for example, I think one of the interesting aspects that we've been mulling over as a project team are the normative environment and the normative indicators. So we did see um, change on the chore sharing, um, so gender equitable chore sharing between um, brothers and sisters in their households. And that impact lasted across waves. So um, the results that we have not heard today and that we're still in the process of analyzing and hoping to share out our results from um, Kinshasa wave five. So um, I can drop in the chat in a, in a bit um, the results that we have in our report from wave five, but that shows the longitudinal findings of the impact of gender equitable chore sharing on growing up great um, among growing up great um, participants. What we did not see though, are the changes in the larger gender norms. Um, so the more um, 
you know, there were other aspects of gender norms, for example, gender roles. So the male should be the breadwinner in a home and the female should be taking care of the children. What we think might be the reason for that is that those norms are established um, well before the kids enter growing up great and that the program might not be designed specifically to test that. Um, so I'll drop some resources in the chat um, that can show you further evidence um, longitudinally of the impacts that we saw of growing up great. We also saw some novel impacts later on after the intervention. And another idea that we have is that some of the indicators may become more relevant to adolescents when they're at the developmental stage, when that behavior is um, important to them. So for example, knowledge about menstruation was not uh, we did not see impact of the intervention at wave two, but we did see it later on when more of the girls um, had reached menarche. Thanks, Kate. Uh, that's um, really helpful. And let me move on. So that was more of a research question. Let me move on to a program question. And I think Alice just shared a very interesting question about fidelity. You know, we know that, and there is also a question about facilitation and whether the facilitators are really embracing these new norms and attitudes and behaviors. So maybe I could ask um, our folks on the program side to talk a little bit about um, how you're dealing with fidelity and quality control to the intervention as, the, as these programs roll out and what you're learning about training and supporting facilitators. So maybe we can start with someone from Satara on that. Um, and then if Jen's still here, I know she has to leave, we can move on to growing up great. Ray, would you like to answer that or Ishta? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Rebecca. I think uh, for the program implementation, this is still one of the um, um, challenges that we have um, on 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 um, ensuring uh, about the structure and also the principles of the uh, program itself. Because, like, um, since uh, in Indonesia there are some of the structures going on like for example the the new ministry have their own um, um vision of making this uh, education system so there's new curriculum but then uh as especially for the power to youth itself we are working at the rural level area so um they, they have to catch up with the new curriculum and that also in influence the idea of the implementation of satara itself and um we're, we're still trying to see and how to best um um monitor the um learning the 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 um you know the delivery of the satara itself but um yeah we we we're, we're going to see that as well as uh and um trying to make it in line with the implementation outside school at the community level so we hope that the evaluation will be um um better in a way that uh, all of the um a component that we have already uh, talked about before and for the facilitators itself we are so we're we're still trying to see how that the teachers um uh, one of the challenges as well on the facilitator uh, on the teachers as well uh, about the um changing of the structure in schools the 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 had of the schools are having so much power or the district of education at the education office at the district level has there so much power and you know um changing the structures of the teachers somehow they are like going out and going in um easily so that's one of the challenges on how we are ensuring the transfer of knowledge and of course the um sustainability of each school in delivering the satara um, I might not have like the best answer to that, but we're still trying to see and to try some of the elements to some of the tools, some of the mechanism to make it more, uh, to make a, a better improvement of our delivery of Satara. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I think it's an issue that everyone is struggling with quite a bit. Um, Jen, do you have any comments you'd like to add on to the fidelity facilitation question? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I uh, what Ray said resonates with me. It's it's really challenging and and for growing up great, um, we had different types of facilitators for the in school and the out of school components. Um, some of the school led groups were they were peer led, so very young adolescents were facilitating sessions with support from teachers. And for the out of school groups, it was um, trained adult facilitators, and so they had different 
challenges in terms of um, fidelity and, and using the sort of participatory um, methods. And I alluded to that a bit in my presentation, but I, I like to think about um, the contextual challenges as well. And in Kinshasa, it's a very, it's a very challenging implementation context, um, thinking about how, how overcrowded the schools are and how difficult it is for people to even just get to sessions on time. Um, and our implementation was interrupted by national elections, by COVID. Um, and so all of these things sort of played into uh, fidelity and how we were able to adhere to the sort of original program design. Um, but I think um, one thing that I can say about facilitators specifically is we tracked a lot of that through some very robust monitoring data and um, actually found that the training was one of the most important components. And so as we moved from pilot to scale up, we extended the length of the training for all of our facilitator cadres to try and strengthen their ability to implement with fidelity. So definitely mm -hmm. an important question. Thanks, Jen. I think we don't have time for another question, but I'm going to um, turn it back over to um, Kristen, but just one, the question I was going to ask that we can all think about maybe in our minds going forward is around the male involvement. So the results showed that boys had unique vulnerabilities and that they were affected differently, you know, by the intervention. So I think it's kind of an interesting area for us to consider thinking about as we move forward, working with early adolescents about how do we engage boys and girls? There was discussion about single versus you know, mixed group. So I'll leave that, I think, for all of us to think about and work on moving forward. And I'll turn the mic back over to Kristen, please. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and a great thing for us all to ponder. Um, so I want to just thank everyone for um, being part of this. There's a lot of work that went into this, um, especially the supplement. Um, I really want to give a shout out to Trevor um, Arnett, who you did not see, but he is very much the one who helped organize all of this um, and get us onto um, on point. And so um, really want to say thank you. And we have a number of members on our team that you did not hear from that also um, key people. We would not be able to have any of this um, be done um, without them. So I really want to thank all of them. Um, and especially, I think Rob, Bob Blum, you're still on here. Um, mm -hmm. At least I saw your name and, and he was the one who actually is the starter of all of this. So um, it, I think it was now maybe more than a decade ago that we had this um, thought that we should focus on and that's the age group. So <laughs> we want to appreciate that and look at where we all are now. So um, on that note, thank you all for this exciting um um, and great webinar. It was wonderful to hear from all of you, at least in the chat, and to listen to the questions. And we look forward to continued dialogue as we move forward. So thank you all. <laughs>